Hello and welcome back. This is Luna Love Empress and I'm your host, Naz. Today we are on a part three of the reality of the narcissist. And in this part, we're going to be discussing a few life, real life experiences with the narcissist and advice based on how to deal with such situations. We kind of have already gone through some of that, but now it's going to be based on real life experiences. <laughs> We kind of really explain the trials of how they can make their target feel. But it is especially important to understand that just listening and reading things, okay, and looking up information about them is not where it only ends, okay, when it comes to a narcissist. We also do understand that, yes, we are educating ourselves when it comes to reading about these um narcissistic triads and the symptoms of narcissists and the way the narcissist treats us but you've got to remember that the narcissist is a pro at this game so what you know you're already reading the narcissist has probably already read these now it's almost like having a constant battle between you and the narcissist and it's almost as if you're going into war with the narcissist but it doesn't have to be like that. Before we go any further, let's just take a look at some real life experiences that um, people that I know have kindly shared. For this reason, their names are gonna be left anonymous and they have used substitute names for their own safety and well-being. The first person that we have spoken to was Rachel. And Rachel kindly has left us her input on what she feels the narcissist is. So Rachel says, a narcissist is a person who has excessive need for admiration, disregarding for others' feelings and inability to handle any criticism and sense of entitlement. They like promoting, pointing out people's faults and lowering people's self-esteem. Now, um, we have kind of mentioned this a little bit as well about um, the admiration and disregard of other people's feelings. She's mentioned quite a lot here about how they disregard other people's feelings and how the narcissist always wants the I am approval and again um, a side note it's all about the ego the narcissist wants to feed their ego the ego is I want I need I must have the ego wants control especially when it's the narcissist the ego has its own perception for the narcissist and that perception is then distorted. The perception and the distortion both come together in both these equations and that leads to the narcissist really thinking that there's nothing both wrong. These triads can come under gaslighting which is pretty much what we've mentioned before and that can then inevitably lower our self-esteem and our confidence. Next one that we do have here is from Serena. <laughs> Serena has um, put quite a lot of information here. Serena goes to say, what people don't realize about narcissists is that they don't believe they are narcissists. They believe that they are completely and totally right. Again, two people mentioning the same kind of characteristics of narcissism. And these characteristics are about the ego and how the narcissist likes feeding their ego they believe they are completely and totally right they have a favorite child and they have a scapegoat they put up such a facade that no one will believe you if you tell them what is really happening they look weak or like they're a victim to the outside eye because they choose to look this way and usually the favorite child follows in their footsteps. When people realize the truth and believe you, it's too late. The damage is done. You're insecure, depressed, anxious, antisocial, need serious mental help. And still they take the narcissist's side. It's unreal, yet completely normal. I'm gonna focus on these points just a little bit more because I, as a person who has experienced narcissism can tell you that the favorite child part and having 
them as a scapegoat is so very very traumatic in so many ways the narcissist likes to have as i quote the golden child the golden child is who they use i repeat they use there is no such thing as a favorite child for the narcissist they use the favorite child as we like to call it in this case using them so that they can gaslight the other child again it's ego it's all ego favoritism is a word that i like to use more often when it comes to the narcissistic triad as i was growing up i was dealing with a lot of issues around favoritism the narcissist put it down to me being very hyperactive the narcissist put it down to me being um jealous never really fitting in what they really actually doing is they using the special child to bounce back and how do they do that by using this child to instigate the other child thus they cause a rift between the two children this may have happened because it's happened in their own family and is quite normal nothing nothing can justify this nothing it can ruin the childhood it can ruin the child's memory they feed off the other child's weakness that is exactly what the narcissist does because they are weak themselves and they have flaws themselves so this inevitably means that the narcissist is actually using that child's weakness and bouncing their own energies off onto that child they want a sense of control superiority this can and i cannot express enough inevitably ruin the child's childhood and as they grow up they will think that this is all normal and this is okay god only knows because i've been there it takes months even years sometimes to to remove these traumas that have been inflicted deep within your inner child another good point that she has made is that they put up such a facade that no one will believe you facade is another word for drama and that is exactly what the narcissist does the narcissist craves drama why do they crave such drama it's because again when it doesn't go and when it's not about the i am for the narcissist and it becomes about us it becomes about all of us the narcissist feels like they have lost control and that they need that attention so they cause drama and they cause chaos so that they can bring in back they can bring back to themselves that same um i am energy so that it's about them have you ever noticed when you speak to a narcissist they're always going to come in and put the whole i am quote in and not about us unless it means something for them unless it's something in it for them they like to look weak or like to look the, like a victim Now the reason why they like to look like a victim or the reason why they are trying to make themselves look weak and vulnerable is because it is called reverse psychology oh my god I had this as growing up and as I was growing up I felt so weak and vulnerable because no one actually listened to me and the reason why this happens is because a lot of the time people that are coming in from outside need to really educate themselves um on a more psychological level on how to deal with such people and that's why you will see that psychologists understand and can read body language and most of the time they can distinguish between the narcissist and who is not really the narcissist narcissism 
I would say is a quite a common triad in a lot of people that goes undiagnosed because the narcissist has almost this mask that they are so easily able to mask over their own face. They like to play victim because it's almost gaslighting and they like to turn and flip the tables around onto the other person. This is where that quote tends to come in, flipping the tables over or flipping the coin so that they are now the victim and you are looking guilty. They try to instigate this, this energy inside of you, this burning flame inside of you that, that makes you want to bubble up into a volcano and, and let out your frustration in front of everyone. And then inevitably, that makes you look like you are the bad, you are the bad one, you are the bad person. The way to deal with such issues I've learned is to be present in the moment and not to storm off and walk away. When you do this, you're giving the people who don't believe you the chance to believe the narcissist. Listen very closely to what the narcissist is saying and the words that they are using. Put yourself outside of the box. Put your mind outside of the box. When you are in the situation, listen and put your mind outside of that box. And when you put your mind outside of that box, my God, you're going to start to see ways of coming back in. One way to do this is visualization. Listen to the narcissist and then visualize. If you were a person on the outside, how would you be hearing this person? And when you hear this person, how are you going to respond to that person? Inevitably, your perception changes. And that is when you can start using techniques and words in such a way to correlate, almost to say, yes, the narcissist is kind of right. But we, and when you start to use the word we in a very strong way, the opposite person then turns around and starts to notice how the narcissist said I and how you said we. See what's happening? These small little tweaks and different ways of tweaking that situation can really help you and benefit you in so so many ways first thing to do is always be honest this is probably the one most hardest thing to do especially when you as a child have been growing up into the fear of not being saying you just don't say anything and it's because we've been trained by the narcissist we have been used as pawns in the situation by the narcissist if you say anything, they will take you away from you. It's one of the main quotes that I used to hear as I was growing up. And now, I tell, I tell people, yes, this person is a narcissist. So that way they're already better equipped in their mind to know what they are dealing with. And there's nothing wrong with telling the other person and the opposite person that yes, this person is a narcissist. In fact, it helps them to better understand and build that knowledge up before they even come out and speak to a narcissist because they have educated themselves. Don't think that this person who you are speaking to is not going to understand. And whether they know what a narcissist is or is not, they will find out what the narcissist is like. Most people who deal with narcissists are trained in body language, in psychology. They have built the resilience to deal with people as such. So there is nothing to be afraid of. Fear is the one most important thing that the narcissist likes to put inside of you. And then they like to feed off that fear. Are you going to give the narcissist the fear? 
It's easier said than done, I do understand. And I completely sympathise with people who are dealing with toxic, narcissistic relationships. I completely do sympathise with them. As somebody who has personally experienced this, I can tell you, there is no easy way of dealing with the narcissist except standing your ground and putting in those boundaries. And I cannot stress it enough that resilience and boundaries are what's going to help you push past the narcissist. Another way is, like I mentioned before, ghosting the narcissist. It's harder when you're inside the same live-in relationship, but there are ways around dealing with ghosting a narcissist. She also mentioned here as well, that they usually go with the favourite child and the favourite child follows the footsteps. As I mentioned, the child then grows up to think that this is very normal behaviour, this is okay, and then they inevitably do it with children and outside the world. Until they start to realise the actual damage and the traumas that it's caused um, them. When the damage is done, and you're insecure, depressed, anxious, antisocial, and need serious mental help, she says, the help that you receive would normally be a CBT, some kind of psychological therapy that the victim would then need. But the victim would then be dealing with their childhood traumas internally. And this is so, 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 so important when it comes to dealing with such traumatic events. It's not about just releasing and letting go of the stress and the toxicity that the narcissist has put on you in this present moment is about letting go, going deep within yourself and releasing the toxicity, the inner traumas. And as you notice, when you start to do these things, the traumas start to resurface. And when they do resurface, this is so, so important that you don't bury them back in again. Because inevitably, these traumas are there to stop you from becoming someone toxic and following those footsteps. Also, it helps you to become more resilient and release those fears that the narcissist has put in you for so, so long. She then goes on to say, and still they take the narcissist's side. Why does this happen? You've gone through all the mental abuse and the traumas and then still this person sees it as, okay, you were wrong and that is why you need the therapy. And the narcissist sits there smirking. And yet they still act like a victim and get away with things. It's because as a whole society, we have not trained ourselves. We have not, or... Um, got the information, the correct information that we need to identify and distinguish between the narcissist and who is not a narcissist. It is so, so, so easy because the line is so thin. It's almost like, let's say you have a transparent um sheet between you and this narcissist and this narcissist is merely just a reflection of who you are they can take your image and become that person and within moments you're left in oh and wonder the narcissist is so good at doing these things if you put somebody who hasn't been trained in dealing or seeing or even understanding what the narcissistic triads are and you put them in front of that transparent sheet and they're looking at you and the narcissist, they will not know who the narcissist is. One tip I do want to give to you is that don't use I words when dealing with a narcissist in front of a third party. Now, the answer may seem quite obvious to you, but actually, it's a lot more complex reason as to why we don't use the word I in front of the narcissist. 
when dealing with a third party. So you have somebody coming in, a psychologist, and the psychologist is trying to distinguish between the narcissist and you. The narcissist will say the I words and you are going to say, actually, I am the one who's been hurt here. You make the situation just a tad a little bit difficult for the, the psychologist to see and differentiate between the narcissist and you. And then inevitably the psychologist might say that you have narcissistic traits because of the I word. I am. I must. Right? So, you may be wondering that if the psychologist is actually trained in all of this, then why do you even need to worry? Well, point is, is that the narcissist is one step ahead of the game and they know exactly how to say things. I'm trying to work with this person in order to deal with, you know, family complications, but she doesn't seem to want to reciprocate. And you will then may turn around and say, that is not true. I've tried everything. See how you look like a narcissist now? Because those are the same words that a narcissist might use. The one thing that you should ideally be doing when dealing with the narcissist is saying, yes, you did ask me. And the only reason why I feel that this may not work is because we may be better with a mediation, somebody on the outside coming in. Because I feel that we may end up in an argument. So it's not just about not using the I words altogether because that's not going to be inevitable, right? <laughs> it's about using the I word in a different way, in a different sentence, by incorporating the we, so that you are acknowledging the narcissist, but you're also acknowledging your own needs as well. Thus, making it out like you are not playing the blame game, because when you start to throw the blame onto the narcissist, you are then proving that you are the narcissist. Don't play their games back onto them. The narcissist may turn around and say, I've been nothing but nice to you. I've done this and X, Y, Z for you. You may turn around and say, well, I've done this and this and this for you. And inevitably, all you've done is you've turned the tables back around and you've took on the energy of the narcissist. The best way to deal with this situation, this scenario, is to stay quiet. Because when the narcissist doesn't have anything to feed back off, they will keep doing this and inevitably they will slip and when they slip it's usually their own mistakes that make them look guilty if you must talk to explain your side of the story or to say what you need to say and bring your point of view forward um, to the narcissist the best way I would definitely recommend doing this is by um equipping yourself beforehand so you may turn around and you may say okay well um if the person turns around and blames things on you and says i've done this to you and you must speak the first thing you might want to say is thank you i appreciate everything that you have done for me i really really do Don't use word but. Instead say, I think that we can work on this together. I really do. I think that we need to work on this together. Because when you start to put in your own input into the situation, inevitably the narcissist is going to say, see, it's all about her. And they'll turn the tables again. I don't know how many of you guys have noticed this happening, but when you're dealing with a narcissist, they can use any technique and turn your words into something so different. It's like making a recipe for disaster. <laughs> it really is. 
When you say that, the idea is to leave the, the narcissist speechless. Saying that, they will turn around and say, yes, let's do it. And I've tried so hard to work with you, um, but you don't. Turn around and say it again. Let's try again. Let's try it again. And that's not saying that you must work with them. But we're talking about when a third party or an outside person comes in and they want to speak to you and the narcissist together to work on things. This is for that particular situation. And so that is where you must really use psychology. It's almost like reversing the psychology but not taking on the narcissist's energy. Now, I know this was quite a lot to take on board, and of course it's become quite overwhelming for a lot of people who are dealing with a narcissist to really um, be able to kind of take all these and, and put it into your mind when it's already overwhelmed with whatever the narcissist is doing. I, I totally understand that. Okay, um, and be free to take some pointers and write down some notes and work around the situation on how you feel comfortable. Okay, one last experience I'd like to give to you, and this one's based off culture. Oh, love it. <laughs> culture has a lot to do with our upbringing and how we have been known to behave in families, right? And this tends to come a lot from back home countries and societies. This is no blame game. I am not placing blame on any cultural, religion, background. It's an overall topic and an overall conversation. Um, so when I was growing up, in my family, shouting, fighting, slapping was quite common. Um, and this is, like I said, not directing on any religion or culture. But I need to put this out there. I'm not saying that there was no love in my family or anything like that. <laughs> Okay, but from generations, this was known to be an okay thing to do, right? Now, if you speak to parents or even perhaps grandparents, they will tell you that um, there was nothing wrong with this method. In fact, it worked a lot better, right? But it's a psychological effect, okay, um, of all those negative factors that can actually affect us into adulthood the way we are now, okay? Or even in our teens actually and how we form ourselves to behave i kind of touched upon this just a little bit before okay um but i'm just gonna mention it again because we're now into the culture part of things so for example we turn into narcissists or we kind of have a little bit of that energy within us okay now i'm not going to go into bio biology and um, or psychologically part of things just yet when it comes to the culture part of things um but it's important to mention that so we do um so we do have that information that yes it can stem from cultural things okay it's really important to uh, understand this but then what do we do with all of this information well firstly <laughs> you just educated yourself well done <laughs> um secondly i'm going to tell you how to implement a positive mindset now okay that will help you to deal with the narc and not only the narc but anybody else who manipulates and controls you right so the first thing you want to do okay with all of this information is deal with your confidence okay confidence is key okay because the narcissist can screw your self-esteem and bring your confidence down so much that it can literally shatter you into like little pieces right and to do this um they really know how to put their foot on your chest Okay, they really do. Now, your confidence is one of the most important things that you need in order to fully thrive. Okay, and we all know confidence is key to success, right? It gives you motivation, that drive to do things. This one's really hard because a lot of us have fear. Okay, but um, all you have to do, like I said, is take very baby steps. So, for example, you can contact your doctor, okay, and the first thing you might need to get is some psychological help. I'm not saying you're crazy, but that is different ways of doing things. So, counselling, CBT, okay, may help with these things as well, okay. You can talk to your family and friends if you're not too comfortable. And sometimes I've noticed that friends, family, mostly family, are very difficult people to communicate with, especially when they are part of that family, okay. Again, cultural issues can come in, in all of this. Um... 
there are support lines as well and even groups on facebook which i've noticed really really do help okay now i know this can be scary and more than ever nerve-wracking your anxiety can really really start to build up okay but you can't let the fear stop you because that way if you if you let fear stop you, you can't break that barrier you won't be able to okay <laughs> So we tend to think about obviously like you know one of the fear factors obviously of this is is society and what friends and family may end up saying and what they'll think of us remember there are people like you out there who haven't actually reached out for help and by you taking that first step you've just encouraged a whole bunch of people who don't have the confidence to go out there and work on themselves work on their confidence okay that one step you take will make a huge difference to yourself and then you will open up a whole world of people who you will notice who have had so much narcissistic abuse in their life i joined a facebook group um and that facebook group was uh, it was amazing because i saw so many people going through the same thing and when i put my own input in there about help that i needed they were not judgmental they were not judgmental they in fact were very very open to helping me and which was so so nice so see there is so many out there um there's so many people who need help the same way you guys do right the next thing you need is resilience oh my god i have to shout this out so loud right now because this is the one thing that's really going to help you resilience okay resilience is one of those things that can either make us or break us resilience is about standing up for your rights for what you believe in and that does not like me go out there and start protesting at all okay um, i mean even though resilience confidence um all these things can actually help <laughs> right but it what it really means is that when we have resilience we're better able to control how a person can speak to us and we will and what we will not allow in okay that then obviously inevitably leads to boundaries i'm coming to that um for example i will allow my children to see their dad but i won't allow their dad to trash talk to my children about me right so like i said this is now where the boundaries come in okay so um boundaries and how to implement them okay is pretty much part of resilience they correlate with each other so let's take the example that i've just mentioned just now okay if say for example we don't want the dad to say horrible things about you okay or me or anybody else for that example okay but we don't want to stop the kids from actually seeing their dad right so what boundaries would you then implement and the you have like kind of a situation here with two scenarios going on right so it's a little bit of a difficult situation let's just say but there is a way around it okay because again everything has a situation a way around something okay and so what you would do is um it may mean that you would get a family lawyer to write up a legal document stating the rules that when the child comes to see their father um they must not do so so and so and so or they will have um supervised visitations right so that a third party would be there to make sure that they are looking after the children they are there with the children but they're not saying anything bad about the children right second thing oh sorry third is that we're on the third or fourth i think we're on the fourth fourth thing is and this is probably the last most important thing i want to say that comes in with confidence is self-love so so important to incorporate self-love self-love is not about just going out there and buying yourself some chocolate and some roses and treating yourself to a nice massage even though that kind of does feel good right <laughs> so um self-love is about accepting yourself for who you are and who you really want to be right accepting your flaws your imperfections this one's the hardest thing to do for the victim okay um after leaving the narc I don't want to dwell too much on the negatives about the narc and how it makes you feel in terms of your self-love okay um because that's not really going to help the situation here okay but 
what we really need to do is once we um, start to, to accept self-love, okay, we begin to listen to our high selves better. We learn to love ourselves unconditionally and then we don't accept anything less from ourselves, okay? Um, at some point, I will try to make another video on the self-love part, okay? Because it's so, so important to incorporate that, that self-love um, within us, okay? If you guys would like to see some videos on self-love and uh, you want some more information on that, do leave me a comment down below. I love hearing from you guys all the time, okay? Um, and I definitely will be posting at some point, okay, a video of self-love if that's what you guys want. Um, but... This is kind of where I'm going to leave this video here because I feel like I've kind of uh, put out a lot of information there already for you guys in terms of the narcissist and how to deal with the narcissist. But next um, on the reality of the narcissist, I'll be discussing about cultural influences versus the narc, okay? So um, this one's going to be quite interesting. <laughs> Definitely leave me some comments down below if you haven't already subscribed ding ding smash that like button And don't forget to subscribe to the channel down below and also hit that notification bell So, you know when my next video is uploading Okay, and don't forget to leave me some comments down below because I definitely respond to you guys and I love hearing from you guys um, What you would like to see next and anything else that you guys want to speak about Okay, because when you have the confidence to speak up others will have the confidence as well to speak up too okay so until the next video guys i will love you and leave you with love and light bye bye